Liam. <laughs> Liam? What are you doing with that? Liam? Phoenix turned and fired twice. The 35 millimeter bullets spitting through the air and splintering the brickwork two inches to the left of the Russian thug's shoulder. A moment later came the reply of the Utsi semi-automatic, and Phoenix twisted round. Mrs. Bundy? Mrs. Bundy? Her lips, searching in the sapphire, honey-scented darkness, found his. Cool, forceful, unresisting, and as the frozen waves crashed down... Afternoon, Mrs. Hutton. Oh! Afternoon, Mrs. Bundy. <laughs> Got your meeting, have you? Yes, I'm on my way. Is, uh, Gerald, uh, Mr. Hadley, is he in? Yes. You'll be the first. Will I? Oh, right. He pulled her towards him, his powerful, masculine hands tearing at the silk fabric of her goatee nightshirt. Scum! Scum! Scumbag, scumbag, scum. The repetitive beat of the inner city drum. Scumbag, scumbag, scumbag. Scum. Yes. What is that? It's Hector, my dragon. I thought I might take him to the writer's group. God's woman, you're not serious. How's it going? It was going very well until you interrupted me. Scum. Scumbag. Scumbag. Scum. It's a bit repetitive, isn't it? Yes, it is. That's the point. Sebastian Lydiard, great-grandson of Herbert Lydiard, who'd served under Sir John Jarvis against Napoleon. We ought to go, Honoria. We're going to be late. Well, they can wait. I've almost finished the 19th century. Oh, I am pleased. Sebastian Lydiard, Edward Lydiard, the Right Honourable William Lydiard, George Lydiard, Herbert Lydiard, Henry Lydiard, and then... Ralph. Ralph. Yes. Ralph Lydiard. Do you ever regret marrying him, Amy? I wonder if you ever think that but for you, he might still be alive. No. Well, I do. So, now we come to the question of which writer we invite to address us. What about Jilly Cooper? <laughs> Thought he said a writer. <laughs> Do you think we could interest Frederick Forsyth? I rather doubt it. Oh, it's a wonderful idea, Gerald. Well, especially uh, since you're writing a thriller, I think Frederick Forsyth would be first rate. He'd never come. He'd just pretend he didn't have time. They always do. I'd like Seamus Heaney. 
The poet? Oh, not another poet. That last one was such a ghastly little man. Yes. What about Max Jennings? What? Max Jennings. Why him? What do you mean? Who is Max Jennings? You know, Honoria, that book I was reading, Far Away Hills, it was a bestseller. No. 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 I'm the chairman of this group. I don't want him here. Why not? I don't think he's very good. Look, what about uh, Alan Bennett? Tried him last year. Geoffrey Archer? Vulgar. Look, it's getting late and I've got marking for a class tomorrow. Why don't we take a vote? Max Jennings. I say no. I'm against it. It doesn't make any difference. It's a majority vote. Max Jennings it is. Yeah, it's from something called the Midsummer Worthy Writers Circle. They want me to give them a talk. We're going to go, are you? Letters from somebody called Brian Clapper. He's got his own letterhead. Chairman Gerald Hadley. Do you know him? Isn't it a bit early for that? No, I'm awake. Gerald Hadley. They've invited me on July the 1st. I thought you had to be in Dusseldorf or Denmark or somewhere. I'm in Denmark on the 2nd. You don't want to go to a boring writer's circle? As a matter of fact, I do. Yes. As a matter of fact, I do. You're going to be late. Yeah, it's really quite a treat. Got a couple of burglaries, car theft. Nothing much to hurry in for. If someone doesn't get murdered soon, you'll only get tetchy. No, I won't. See, you already are. No, I am not. Oh, I'll get it. Cully! Hi, hi. This is a surprise. I thought you were on your way to Poland. Yeah, we are. No, I'll explain. This is Brad, by the Hello, way. Hello, Brad. We've only got a minute. Oh, just come in, come in, come in. Your mum's in. Does he talk? Shh. So we're joining the rest of the group in Paris, and then we're going to go on by train. Will they understand much ado about nothing in Poland? Dad, it's Shakespeare. They understand him everywhere. The way Brad's directed it, it's very... Non-verbal? Visual. So, what brings you all the way out here, darling? Not that we're not pleased to see you. It's got nothing to do with that wicker basket you've been trying hard not to let me see, is it? You would notice, wouldn't you? Oh. His name's Kilmowski. He's a Russian blue. Is it yours? Yeah, I sort of adopted him. Oh, don't tell me. You're looking for new foster parents. Eh? Well, it's just while I'm away. He's very clean. He won't be any trouble. I'll bring you some Polish vodka. Oh, is it bribery now, is it? It's just for three weeks. Besides, Mum said you weren't very busy. Well, that is true. Never known it's a quiet. Just make sure you remember to come home.
Yes, I'm fine. No, you're crying. No, it's hay fever. Hmm. Can I help you, Honoria? Yes, you said you might have some more papers coming in. Navy news? Oh, yes. Yes, they're over here. What a pretty table. You have so many pretty things, my dear. I suppose it comes from being in trade. Yes. They're from the 70s, 78 and 9. I don't know if that's of any interest. They might be, indeed. Excuse me. <clears throat> the spinning wheel. How can I help you? Oh, no, we don't go out and get many, many of those. Oh, you could try for us. Oh, people. If you'd like to leave me your telephone number, if I see one, I'll certainly let you know. Right. Honoria? The meeting isn't until 7.30, Honoria. Early. Hmm. I thought dragons were supposed to breathe fire. Oh, he hasn't learned to do that yet. It's the story. I'm going to have a bath. Get ready for tonight. Max Jennings, I finished his book. It's very good. Oh, well, I'm glad while I was out working you had time for a nice read. If you've got any strength left, maybe you could bring me a cup of tea. Amy, will I give you a hand? Oh, no, no, I'm all right, just getting the shopping. Amy. You all right, Gerald? No, as a matter of fact, I'm not. The thing is, I'm afraid. Afraid? Max Jennings, the writer who's coming tonight. What about him? I knew him a long time ago. Amy, I, I want you to do me a favour. I don't want you to leave the two of us together. Not for one minute. Would you promise me that? Oh, yes, of course. I just uh, don't want to be left alone with him, that's all. When you say a book is true, I don't think it has to be literally the truth. I mean, that's not what writing's all about. You take the truth and you spin something from it. You're creating something new. You're not recording something old. Anyway, I've been talking for quite long enough now, so in conclusion, I would just like to say this. Writers need stamina. We need a wayfaring mind. Nothing should be beneath our attention, but Above all, we need luck. And that's what I wish all of you. Thank you. Well, I can't stay very long, I'm afraid. I'm flying off to a signing session tomorrow, but um, are there any questions? Gerald. No. I'd like to ask a question, Mr. Jennings. Max, please. Well, I was wondering, um... I'm writing a history of England. Oh, really? As seen through the personal chronicles of my family, the Lydiards. Here we go. Which I've traced back to the 14th century. And the line continues all the way to the Falklands, where my late brother Ralph served as an officer on HMS Leicester. Actually, I do have a question. Yes. You were talking about the truth in fiction. So I'd be interested to know, where do you get your ideas? Mainly from experience. Well, that's interesting. 
Because, you see, I don't have any experience that I can write about. Not now. I'd like to ask something. I wondered how you managed to make your characters so real. I worked as a psychiatrist before I took up writing, and so I feel that I know people. I wonder if your characters ever surprise you. In what way? Well, you think you know them. You think they're one thing, and then they turn out to disappoint you completely. Well, I suppose that can happen, yeah. Anyone else? I'm writing a children's book. Oh, yes? It's about a dragon called Hector. <clears throat> and my husband's writing a play. Actually, I'd say I was uh, building it. For me, it's a totally passé word and elitist. Which word? What? Which word is elitist? Building, writing, or play? Writing. You know, we're rapping. We're improvising. We're about free association. You should come to one of my rehearsals, Max. You might find it dangerous. Well, I'd love to, but uh, unfortunately, I have to go. I have a long journey tomorrow. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been uh, a most instructive evening. I'll get your coat. Thank you, Mr Jennings. Good night. We're off too. Got a busy day tomorrow. Marking, rehearsals, right, staff well, meeting. Well, you should try a shift at a modern comprehensive max. Then you really have something to write about. <laughs> Thank you, Max. That was really interesting. Well, good luck with the children's book. I'd like to have heard more about it. Who, Mamie? Actually, Honoria. What? I was thinking. Really? I didn't think you could manage that on your own. Your coat. Thank you. You're leaving. Yes. Well, that's all right. We can all go together. Well. Goodbye, Gerald. Thank you for inviting me. I didn't. Well, it was good to see you anyway. Mr. Jennings. I'm on my way. Well, there is something I actually do want to know, Mr. Jennings. Who do you think would be the best person to approach once my history is finished? I don't want it published by just any old firm. Well, I'm afraid I'm not the best person to ask, Mrs. Miss Lydiard. Most of my contacts are in the field of fiction. Really? To be quite frank, we were expecting a much broader range of knowledge. Honoria. Stupid of me, but I, I seem to have forgotten my gloves. I'll say goodnight. How very rude. We've got to go back in. What? I promised Gerald. What did you promise Gerald? What's it matter anyway? What, Gerald and Max? It's Ma late. We're going home. Now. Your gloves. Any chance of a nightcap? I thought you were flying out. To a signing session. Gerald, what are you doing? Why did you come here? I came to see you.
Mr. Hadley. If it is him, he's not quite recognizable. It's just in here, sir. Oh, where the blood and the police photographers are. Thank you, Troy. Morning, Tom. Morning. Do we have the weapon? I've had it bagged up in the bedroom with the candlestick. <laughs> and before you ask, I'd say between 11 o'clock last night and 1 in the morning. It doesn't look as if he put up much of a struggle. No. And then there's the question of clothes. He's not wearing any. I tell you what, though, Tom, whoever did it must have been in a hell of a temper. Probably killed him with the first blow and then just went on bashing. Yes, George, I saw that. Did you notice the cupboard, sir? If you mean the cupboard that seems to have been emptied, it had caught my attention, yes. OK, so where's this cleaning lady of yours? I've never... No, I... I've never seen... You, you know, a, a dead person before. You all right, carry on. Mm. Now, let's start with this morning. Well, our, the house was in a bit of a mess. It, it was stuff left over from last night. There was some sort of right this evening. Was there anything um, unusual? Yeah, he, his wife's photograph. It, she's dead, and he always kept it in the same place, just there. And when I come in this morning, it was moved. So where was it? Well, someone had put it in the drawer. Did you ever meet her? No. He never talked about his wife. He was a very private man. So you came into the house, you noticed the photograph, and then you went upstairs. I knew there was something wrong. Uh, did you go into the bedroom? Well, of course I didn't go in. Do you think I'm mad? I took one look and I saw him. Start naked on the carpet with his head bashed in, and I scarpered. Well, of course, I didn't bloody go in! So, she didn't go in? Yes, I think we have established that. It could have been opportunistic, sir. A sneak thief caught unawares. He could have been surprised in the bedroom and just panicked. See that Rolex watch on the bedside table, Tom? Yeah? Well, a sneak thief would hardly leave that behind, would he? Now, what about these uh, writers? There were six of them. Brian and Sue Clapper, Amy and Honoria Lydiard, their sisters-in-law, Laura Hutton, she owns the local antique shop, and then there was a visiting writer, but Mrs Bundy didn't know his name. You got any addresses? Well, the Clappers just live over there. Clappers? He's a teacher at Course and Comprehensive. Right, we'll start with them. Oh, and I'd be interested to know what car Hadley drove. Why? Garage, Troy. It's empty. The Midsummer Worthy Writer's Circle. We meet once a month. Of course, there'd be more space at Gresham Hall. That's Noria's house. She wouldn't have it. Ever since Ralph died. Mind you, the place was like a morgue. Freezing cold, even in the middle of summer. Who was Ralph? 
Her brother. She worshipped him. Amy was his wife. Now she lives there. If lives is the right word. Of course, I shouldn't talk out of turn. Poor Gerald. Still so hard to believe. How would you describe Gerald Hadley last night? Was he happy, sad? Tense. Definitely tense. I thought perhaps he and Laura might have had some sort of a row. They were usually so close, but last night she was distinctly frosty. Mind you, probably had something to do with Max Jennings. Gerald was dead set against his coming. Max Jennings, he was the visiting writer. Yes, Brian, that's my husband, had to invite him because Gerald wouldn't. How well did you know Gerald Hadley? Not very well. Nobody did. We've been here about five years, and he'd already been here a couple of years. He's a very quiet man. Did you know his wife? No. He never spoke about her. I asked him once. He got quite upset. Did you happen to see Max Jennings leave after the meeting? No. What about your husband? Brian and I, we went to bed straight away. Brian was asleep the moment his head touched the pillow. Sound asleep. Did you sleep? Oh, not immediately. And I did hear a car pull away. It must have been a little after midnight. Well, that could have been Gerald Hadley's car. No, uh, Gerald's car was stolen the other day in Corston. She was definitely lying about that husband of hers. Which is why we must try to get to him first before she reaches him. Course and comprehensive. You have a problem? I went there, sir. 83 to 90. It's a pity they didn't teach you how to drive. It's a library. Science block over there. They always hoped I'd never come back. You weren't happy here, then? Oh, I couldn't wait to get out. Yeah. I oh, know you, didn't I? Gavin Troy. Hello, Mr. Belgrove. Uh, who are you, then? I'm Chief Inspector Barnaby. I'm with the police. Oh, yeah. Oh, I said he'd come to no good. A bit like bringing him back here, though, isn't it? Oh, see what I mean? And now, gently on the knees. Bend those knees up and down. And shake it out. Shake it out. You got a piece of sticky tape on your fingers and you want to get it off? Shake it out. Remember, making pictures now. Adventure. Explore. Reach out. Reveal. Mm, interesting warm up technique, Edie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> oh. Okay. Gather round, Earthlings! <laughs> Whew, right. We're two acts down. We've done some good work. But now we need something for the end of the play. Well, who can tell me what we need? I need a fag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good one, Denzel. All right, all right, I'll, I'll tell you what we need. It's called a coup... De théâtre. Could he what? <laughs> oh, no, 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 shush, shush, shush. A coup de théâtre. The big scene. The rap. I was walking down the street <laughs> of the day. <laughs> right, OK, um, now think. Well, get into character if it helps. Drop dead, you scumbag. What? What's my character, Bright? Remember. Did you know? Yes, now careful now. No, no, there. No, please. Mr. Clapper! That's enough! Mr. Clapper! What is it, Miss Planter? Some policemen have just arrived at the school, Mr. Clapper. They want to have a word. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Evening, all. <laughs> Right, um, <clears throat> I'll be right back. Just think coup de théâtre. <laughs> See if you can surprise me. Dead. God. 
God, I was actually there, you know, yesterday. Yes, sir. We've uh, already spoken to your wife. Yeah? Well, I'm sure she wouldn't have told you anything. How can I help you? What can you tell me about this uh, visiting writer, Max Jennings? A reactionary fossil. Not a clue about contemporary drama. Hardly surprising when you consider the stuff he turns out. You don't like his books, sir? I haven't read them. But it was you who invited him. Only because Gerald got so uptight, yes. You've no idea why he was so upset? I never asked him, no. Did you see him at all in the hours before the writer's group met? He wasn't in. I saw Honoria Lydiard knocking at his door. Must have been about four. She wasn't getting any reply. Can you tell us anything about him? His background? He was a civil servant who'd taken early retirement, a platinum handshake and a fat pension. Had no time for people like him. Oh, I'm sure. So, um, can we get back to yesterday evening? What time did you leave the group? Well, I would have thought my wife would have told you. 10.15. And you went straight home? Yes, and straight to sleep. Are you quite sure about that, sir? My yay is my yay, and my nay is my nay, Inspector. And I've just told you I didn't go out. <laughs> I'm sure you can find your own way out. Mr. Trapper! I forgot to tell you, your wife telephoned. Too bloody late. <laughs> Gresham House, Honoria Lydiard's home. Have you ever seen Frankenstein, sir? No. This must be where they filmed it. Can't you read? No hawkers, no circulars. Go away, I shall call the police. Miss Lydiard? Miss Lydiard, yes. We are the police. Corston CID. Can we go inside? If you must. There's very little I can tell you, Chief Inspector. I hardly knew Gerald Adley. It seems that hardly anyone in the village did, Miss Lydiard. I saw him once a month. The writer's circle, that's all. You were seen at his house on the afternoon of his death, Miss Lydiard, knocking at the door. Are you trying to suggest that this horrible business has got anything to do with me? I'd agreed to help with the food. Gerald said he'd contribute towards the cost, and I went round to collect the money. That's all. Honoria, have you heard? Oh. These people are from the police. And you are? Amy Lydiard, Honoria's sister-in-law. So it's true about Gerald. We are investigating a murder, Mrs Lydiard, yes. Oh, dear. Did you both come back here after the writer's evening? Yes. We drove home together. And then? I retired straight away. I had a bad headache. The visitor, Max Jennings, had been allowed to smoke. Disgusting habit. And you, uh, Mrs. Lydiard? Not quite straight away. I m made us drinks. Um, cocoa, actually. They don't want to know every detail of our domestic life, Amy. I'm sorry. Why don't you tell them how much sugar you put in, too? I'll say good day. I'm sorry. I'm a Lydiard, as is my late brother's wife. Our name is woven into the very warp and woof of England. Above reproach, I suggest you pursue your inquiries elsewhere. Hop and what? Wolf. Honoria adored my husband, Chief Inspector. Her brother. That's him there. After he died, I had no money, so she 
let me live with her. I do some light housework in return. Well, most of it, really. Thank you. Mrs. Lydia, what can you tell me about Gerald Hadley? He was terrified of... of meeting Max Jennings. Oh, Chief Inspector. This is all my fault. He asked me not to leave the two of them together. Not for a minute. And I promised him. Gerald Hadley. Yes. He said he was frightened. And I said I'd stay. But then everything went wrong. Why? What happened? We were the last to leave. Honoria, Max Jennings and me. And then... I seem to have forgotten my gloves. How very rude. We've got to go back in there. I wanted to go back in. But Honoria was in, in a hurry to leave. So I left him on his own. Miss Lydia, can you remember who it was suggested inviting Max Jennings in the first place? That was me. <laughs> God, how can people live like that? I don't think Amy Lydia has got a choice. I wonder what she'd do to get away. been so sudden. Afraid I can't help you, Mr. Barnaby. My husband isn't here. He flew to Denmark after that writer's thing, signing books. Max is very big in Denmark. Did he come back here after the writer's group meeting, Mrs. Jennings? No. It was easier to overnight at Heathrow. Do you remember the name of the airline? No. Well, do you know how we can reach him? No. I have to ask his secretary, Bouncing Barbara. She made the reservations. Barbara? Barbara Neal. What's her name? Do you know where we can get in touch with her? No, not really. Look, will you excuse me? I really don't think this is a do with me. Swimming in her jewels. Get hold of this Barbara Neal, and while you're at it, check the passenger lists of all the flights to Denmark. You think Max Jennings? Right, and stop here. Bookshop, sir. Yes, Troy. Books. So who was he? The victim? I'm not sure. The more I hear about him, the less I seem to know him. He was Gerald Hadley, ex-civil servant from Kent. But that's all. His house. He didn't tell me a thing about him. What do you mean? Well, he had no character. There were no souvenirs, no mail, no personal documents, not even a driving licence. Just a photograph of his dead wife. Just one photograph. Doesn't that strike you as strange? How many have you got of me? Oh, I have two of you in my wallet. Now, whoever killed Hadley took away a suitcase. How do you know that? Well, there's a set of three. The middle one was missing. It's a brown suitcase with the initial G-H. Yeah. Where's the cat? Kilmowski? Mm. I haven't seen him. Joyce? He's lonely. 
I don't care if he's manically depressed, he's not sleeping there. Just for tonight? Not tonight, not ever. Aren't you coming to bed? No. I'm not sleepy. I'm going out. You were out last night, too. You didn't tell them that. Who? Dixon had looked green and his fascist sidekick. No. Goose stepping in, trying to trick me into... Trick you into what? Doesn't matter. You didn't tell them. No. But you were out last night, Brian. Where did you go? Round the green, blow the cobwebs. Then why didn't you tell them that? Why did you have to lie? Oh, forget it. Just forget it. Sir? Good morning. I've got that information on Hadley's car, sir. A blue Celica. Registration Papa 844 Alpha Papa Charlie. Reported stolen between 9 and 11 in course. Who reported it? Uh, he did it from home. It was logged at 5 to midnight. Doesn't that strike you as odd? What? Well, the car is stolen between 9 and 11 in Corston. But he doesn't report it for another hour. And why wait till he gets home? Oh, there was something else, sir. Max Jennings. I checked all the flights to Denmark from Heathrow and Gatwick and all the ferries. He wasn't on any of them. What was the name of that secretary? Bouncing Barbara. I look after all Max's paperwork. VAT returns, fan mail, book signings, appearances. Wouldn't it be easier to work at his house? Max keeps his business and his private life very separate. Did you organise his flight to Denmark? Uh, no. Uh, usually I would, but uh, for some reason Max said he'd do that one himself. And the hotel? Yes. I can't think why. I did ask him, but uh, he just told me to forget it. Was he meeting his publisher? I don't know. I really can't help you. Max didn't say anything. The Midsummer Worthy Writers' Circle. Uh, did he mention it? Yes, he told me he was going. I would have thought that half a dozen amateurs in a little village hardly worth the trouble of a writer like Max Jennings. That's what I thought, but... Uh, he knew one of them. Gerald Hadley? Yes, that was the name. Max said he wanted to see him. Were they friends? I don't think so. I got the feeling Max was afraid of him. So which way round was it? According to Amy Lydiard, Gerald Hadley was afraid of Max Jennings. Now his secretary tells us it was Max Jennings who was afraid of Gerald Hadley. Well, maybe they were afraid of each other. Oh, that's very helpful, Troy. Well, she's certainly scared of something. Oh, yes. If you ask me, she's having it away with him. She knows he did it, she knows where he is, and she's hiding it. You all right? Yeah. It could be a washing powder, you know. If it's biological, Yes, you thank you, to... Troy, thank you. I still haven't met anyone who actually knew Gerald Hadley. He had a wife. What was her name? What did she die of? Where did he come from? There's still Laura Hutton. What? We still haven't questioned her, and according to Brian Clapper, her and Gerald Hadley could have been banging each other. Bang in each other. What a delightfully picturesque turn of phrase. All right, back to Midsummer Worthy, and this time I'll drive.
I didn't really know, Gerald. No, I'm sorry. We met once a month at the writers' group and that was all. Just out of interest, what sorts of books were you all writing, Mrs Hutton? Gerald was writing a spy thriller, Sue a children's book, Brian a rather dreadful play. I believe Amy wasn't writing anything, although she did talk about poetry. And of course there's Honoria and her family history. She's always in and out of here. In fact, she came in that afternoon, about four o'clock, the afternoon before it happened. What for? Old magazines. Oh, London Illustrated News, Life magazine, Navy News. She's fanatical about it. Anything to do with her family, or her brother Ralph in particular. As a matter of fact, she stole one of those. Do you know which one? Mm. June 78, they're in order, you see. She probably found another cutting for her book. And what about you, Mrs Hutton? I'm sorry? What were you writing? I was writing a romance. Did you show it to Gerald Hadley? Why do you ask? Oh, yes, of course. I know people talk about me and Gerald, Gerald and me. Well, it's a village. One expects that sort of thing. And it's true that I, uh, I did find Gerald quite attractive. But he never once reciprocated my feelings, not once. We have been told that there was a certain amount of tension between you and Mr Hadley on the night of his death. Who told you that? Please, Mrs Hutton. Very well. I'm a broad-minded person, you know, and what Gerald did in his own time was his own affair. He was, after all, a man. Well, I happened to be passing his house the night before we met for the writer's circle. I'm a bad sleeper, and I often go out walking quite late at night. That night, it must have been about 10 to 12, maybe a little earlier, and that was when I saw it. A woman arrived in a local Corston cab. She paid the driver, got out, and walked towards Gerald's house. I thought she was going to ring the bell, but she let herself in. She had a key. She was quite obviously a prostitute. How can you be sure? Oh, her clothes. The way she walked. What happened? Now, I'm not normally a nosy person. But I have to admit, I was aroused. Uh, my curiosity, that is. I went a little closer, and that was when I saw them. He'd given her a glass of wine and... She was toasting him and laughing. Now, I didn't mind being rejected by Gerald. I didn't mind at all. But to think of him turning to that sort you of... You were angry. No, I wasn't angry. I was disappointed. Mrs Hutton, you didn't by any chance go back there the following evening after the writers' meeting? Well, as a matter of fact, I did. I couldn't sleep, so I went out. About half past twelve. I arrived just in time to see Max Jennings leave. It was clear to me he'd had too much to drink. He took quite a while getting into the car. Did you see Gerald Hadley? No, but there was a light on upstairs in what I imagine was his bedroom. Anyway, I was just about to leave when I saw... It was Brian Clapper. And he went home? I don't know. He could have gone anywhere. I left. You see, I didn't want to be seen outside Gerald's house in the middle of the night. I mean, it could have been misconstrued. So, Brian Clapper was lying. Yes. And he'll still be at school. 
You can have another go at him, sir. No, Troy, you can do that. Oh, I'd like that. <laughs> so, how's the play going, Mr Clapper? Well, obviously, all these interruptions. You didn't tell us what it was called. Slang Huang for five mute voices. Working title. It's very demanding, you know, but they're a great bunch of kids, some real talent. The Carters especially, Edie and Tom, they're terrific. Life stacked against them, but they never give up. The girl especially, Edie. There was just one detail we wanted to get straight, Mr Clapper. Oh, yes. Uh, you told us that you went home at 10.15 and went straight to bed. Yes. Well, we have a witness who says they saw you returning home sometime after midnight. <laughs> what? You are aware that this is a murder investigation? Yes. Well, that night, um... <sighs> right. I did go out, yes. For a drive. Blow the cobwebs, don't know why I forgot to mention it. <laughs> did you see anyone outside Plover's Rest? No. Yes. There was someone. But I didn't see them. I was sort of, um, behind the car, you see, and someone did walk past. I didn't see who it was. Can you tell us actually where you went that night, sir? No. You weren't perhaps on your way to some sort of tryst? Tryst? <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> I was walking, just walking. I woke up and I went for a wank. A walk. <laughs> I bet he went round the local estate. What was that girl he was going on about? Edie. Trying to get a look in the bedroom window. You enjoyed that, didn't you, Troy? Seven years' misery here. It's nice to get a bit of revenge. Oh, yes. <laughs> Where is she, Brian? Are you a suspect? No, I bet you did it, Brian. Why did you do it, Brian? Was Why? it funny? <laughs> <laughs> no! Yeah, all right. No, no, no. Get up. Get up. <laughs> Just sit down. <laughs> now, <clears throat> we've only got a few minutes left, so, uh, how's this scene of yours coming on? You mean our coup de théâtre? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been, uh, working on it, Brian. <laughs> well, I don't see much evidence of it. We meet again next Friday. If you haven't got anything for me by then, I'll have to rush it for you. Edie? Brian, can I have a word? Yeah, sure. What is it? I really need to talk to you. Well, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Come on. Off. It's a wonderful book. I'm not surprised it's a bestseller. You should read it. I gave it to you. Well, it's the story of a young boy, an Irish boy. His name is Liam Hanlon. Liam lives on a farm near Durrow in Southern Ireland. It's a horrible life. He's abused by his father sexually. <laughs> When he's 13 years old, 
Liam shoots his father with his own shotgun and runs away. He meets a man, an artist, and they travel together, first in Europe and then Turkey. Oh, the faraway hills. Jennings has a wonderful way with language. Listen. Is it autobiographical? It reads that way. Um, <clears throat> Liam has bought a flat overlooking the Albert Hall. How'd you get the money? From the artist. He's painted him lots of times, always in historical dress, and they've made a fortune. Anyway, listen. He lies on the bed, the cushion cool against the curves of his neck, and traces his past against the mouldings on the ceiling. I shall! Tom. Oh, I'm sorry, I must have got a bit of flu from Troy. I'm sorry, go, go on, it's good, it's good. You better get that. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, I'm on the way. We've found Max Jennings. Right, sir. Oh, surprise me, Troy. Bit far afield for you, isn't it, George? It's my case too, Tom, and I fancied a day by the sea. So did he, by the look of things. So what do you think? He's been dead 48 hours or more. Poison? I wouldn't be surprised. Look at the eyes. Bilateral ptosis, and there's a little pigmentation at the hair root. Are you all right? Yeah. What? It's a very nasty rash at the side of your neck. <laughs> well, I suppose that's it, then. That's what? Try. The end of the case. What do you mean? Well, we already know that Gerald Hadley and Max Jennings knew each other in the past. There must have been some sort of feud, and it got out of control. Jennings bludgeoned Hadley to death. And then when he came to his senses and realised what he'd done, he came down here and ended it all, rather than face the music. That's what you think, is it? Yes. Well, I don't. Who was Gerald Hadley? What was he before he came to Midsummer Worthy? Whatever happened to his wife? I still don't even know her name. It's like... A blank jigsaw. We've got some of the pieces, but not even the start of a picture. Let's take the day Gerald Hadley died. Honoria Lydiard visits Laura Hutton. The spinning wheel, how can I help you? And she steals some newspapers. She actually steals a newspaper. Well, if you'd like to leave me your telephone number... We know from Brian Clapper that she went straight from the shop to Gerald Hadley. The meeting isn't until 7.30, Honoria. Why? Well, she said it was something to do with the catering. It was a bit late in the day to be worrying about the food. And then, when the evening was finished, why did Max Jennings go back into the house? Why didn't Amy Lydiard manage to stop him? Well, I promised Gerald. And if Jennings did kill him, what about the empty cupboard and the missing suitcase? What was taken? And why was Hadley naked when he died? And we've still got to think about the night before the murder. Thanks, Bob. This woman, Laura Hutton, claims she saw. Who was she? And if Laura Hutton was in love with Gerald Hadley, could she have been jealous enough to bash his head in for unrequited love? Right. I want you to check every minicab in Corston until you find the one that dropped off the blonde woman in Midsummer Worthy in midnight on the 31st. Do a complete background on Gerald Hadley and do the same for Max Jennings. On my desk, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So it's time we got to work.
You all right, sir? Yes. What news on Hadley? We've got no record of his marriage. We can't find an insurance number. There's no birth certificate. And the civil service has never heard of him. Well, what is he then? The invisible man? How about the taxi driver? We're still looking. Oh, there is one thing, though. We found his car, the Celica. No surprises there. A straightforward TDA, wrecked and dumped in the river. Well, at least that's something. Oh, and Barbara Neal's here. Bouncing Barbara. I hope you realise I could have you charged right now with obstruction. I didn't mean to. I didn't want to, but what else could I do? You could have told us the truth and saved us all a lot of time. That seaside cottage was built for two, wasn't it? Max Jennings and you. All right. When did it start? Um, Max uh, used to be a psychiatrist before he was a writer. I was his receptionist. Then I was his secretary. And then... We'd been seeing each other for two years. You knew he was dead, didn't you? Tell me. There was no Denmark. Um, that, that was just what we told Selina. The plan was we were going to meet there, uh, at the cottage. He'd gone down the night before and I followed. It was easier for us to go down separately. Max? I got there about lunchtime. Maxie, darling. You're not in bed already. Maxie? Max? He was lying there on the bed. Well, I thought he must have had a heart attack or something. I never dreamt. And what could I do? I, I couldn't tell you about him without telling about us. I mean, nobody knew. Nobody. We could have saved 48 hours if she'd been straight to the... Oh, shit! Bless you. God damn it, what is wrong with me? Sir? What? Gerald Hadley, we found his solicitor. What sort of man was Gerald Hadley, Mr. Jostler? Well, he was a very private man, unusually reserved. But we looked after his legal affairs for him, including the purchase of Plover's West seven years ago. Do you know where Gerald Hadley came from? London, I can't tell you more than that. Although I believe he did retain a property there. How do you know? We handled a purchase, uh, though no sale. I'm sure more details will come in once we have probate. Oh, you're handling his will as well, are you? Oh, yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> We'd be grateful for any details. Ah, uh, well, I shall. This is a murder investigation, Mr. Jocelyn. Uh, quite. Uh, yes, well, it's, <laughs> it's very straightforward. The bulk of his fortune went to the St. Martin's School of Art. Mr. Hadley wished to endow two scholarships. Was there a lot of money involved? Oh, yes, indeed. How much exactly? In cash? Oh, at least two and a half million pounds. What? Are there any personal bequests? Oh, yes, indeed. Let us see. Here we are. Now then. He left a, a £500 to a Mrs. Bundy. He's cleaner. Uh -huh. And uh, 10000 to the local cricket team. Oh, yes, he left a picture, an oil painting, to a Mrs. Laura Hutton. Ah, yes, and a somewhat larger sum of a hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> Who to? A hundred thousand pounds? Oh, goodness! Did you know that Mr Hadley was planning to leave you something, Mrs Lydiard? Oh, 
He did sometimes joke about it. He said it would amuse him to rescue me from Honoria. When did you come to live here? It was after Ralph died. We had a little house in Spain. We were trying to make a life there. But Ralph got ill. I wrote to Honoria, of course. And the next day she just arrived. She nursed him. She did everything for him. It was as if I wasn't there. And then after Ralph died, she talked to the doctors. She brought his body back to England. I didn't have a penny. There was nothing I could do. And there's nothing more you can tell us about Gerald Hadley about that night? I wish I'd gone back. I should have. I, I promised him. But you didn't. I told you I was making us hot drinks. Honoria had hers in the study. I had mine in bed. It's the warmest room in the house. Will you leave now you have money? Oh, yes, of course. I hate it here. And I can, can't I? I'm rich. Amy, why haven't you started the lunch? These officers have come to give me some news, Honoria. Good news. Well, I'm sure it's of no interest to me. Oh, th I, as a matter of fact, there was something uh, we wanted to ask you, Miss Lydiard. What? Though it's only a, a detail, but I'd be interested to know. What was it that you saw in the Navy news that you took from Mrs. Hutton's shop? I suppose she told you about that. Do you deny it? We just want to know what was in it. It was on page five. There was a picture of the Leicester. That was Ralph's ship. Exactly. I took it from my book. Could I see it? Just out of interest? This is it here. My brother Ralph rose to be a sub-lieutenant, you know. He received two commendations. He would have been an admiral, I'm sure of it. There. On leave in Antalya. Hmm. I really don't see what bearing it can have on your case. Well, as I said, Miss Lydiard, it's uh, just out of interest. Well, that doesn't get us anywhere. Oh, I don't know, Troy. There was something she said in there. Honoria? No, not Honoria. Amy. Here, let me do that. Must you? I've decided to leave. What? I've had enough. I'm going. No, you can't. Yes, I can. I promised Ralph I'd look after you. It's not me you're interested in, Honoria. It's Ralph you want, and he's dead. Keeping me here won't bring him back. Don't talk to me about Ralph. He was my husband. If you'd loved him enough, he wouldn't have died. I'll leave tomorrow. It'll be better for both of us. No. You're a Lydiard. Blood and bone. What? Blood and bone. That's what counts. Blood counts. Bone counts. I'm sorry, Honoria. No! I want to look after you. I want to see you. I need to have you here. <laughs> Laura, what's happening? I'm closed. I'm leaving. Leaving the village? But why? I always used to think that if you loved someone hard enough and for long enough, they wouldn't be able to help loving you back. Well, I've been very foolish. Daryl. That was his. He left it to me. It's beautiful. It's Hilton Connings, you know. 
one of the series of historical boys he painted in the 50s. It's very valuable, but I'll never sell it. It reminds me of him. His name's Baker. He's over there, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I picked her up. Um, I told your officer. It was just after 11 o'clock. Uh, she told me to drive to Midsummer Worthy. Uh, when we got there, she pointed out the house. Other than that, she never said a word. Is there anything else you can tell me about? She was an ugly woman. Tall, a lot of makeup. Nice legs, though. Where did you pick her up? On the corner, just over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. She could have come from anywhere. Can you listen to what he said? Because it could explain the empty wardrobe in Hadley's bedroom and why he had no clothes on. And maybe the photograph of his dead wife, too. What? You think this woman took his clothes? No, no, I don't. This is what we're looking for. I thought Troy, thought Troy was going to have a seizure. It was really very funny. So, Gerald Hadley was a transvestite? Yeah. He parked his car close to the club, and then he must have walked back to it in full woman's dress. But of course he wasn't there. Well, he couldn't just walk into Corston CID just as he was, and that's why he didn't report his car stolen until he got home. And the woman Laura Hutton saw? Wasn't a woman at all. It was dark, and Laura Hutton was hidden in the bushes. And you probably only got a back view anyway. But I thought she saw Gerald Hadley and the woman having a drink together. That's what she thought she saw. There was a mirror in that room, Joyce. And if you ask me, what Laura Hutton saw was Gerald Hadley toasting himself on his lucky escape. My glands are swollen. You're not looking at all well, Tom. Shouldn't you see the doctor? Well, I'll see how I feel when I wake up. It's only a bit of flu. Well, if, if you need my help... <laughs> I do. Come in. Here you are, Bri. Ooh, what is it? Thunderbolt. Mixed wine. Apples and lemons and all that. Cheers. Oh, Um, are we on our own? Mum's out. With Tom. So then, young Edie, what can I do for you? <laughs> Let's sit down. What's the 
play, Brian. I'm nervous. I'm never going to be able to stand up in front of all those people. <sighs> of course you are. My accent's all wrong. No, no, it's perfect. You're perfect. Believe me. But I don't like the character. She really gets on my tits. Tits? Please say you'll help me, Brian. I need you to tell me I'm going to be all right. Oh, God, Eddie, you're more than all right. You're, you're fantastic. You're the best. You don't know how much I've dreamed of this. Oh, Brian. Oh, Edie. Just came for you. Bit early for the post, isn't it? Wasn't in the post. Hand delivered. No stamp. Did you see who delivered it? Didn't look. Oh, did I tell you Laura Hutton's leaving the village? Seems very sudden. Oh, and I spoke to Amy too. You won't believe what has happened. It's an absolute miracle. For God's sake, woman! I've got that report from Dr. Bullard. It was poison that killed Max Jennings. Looks like he had it in a glass of wine. Thallium sulfate. Administered 12 hours before he died. That was when he was with Gerald Hadley in Midsummer Worthy. Mm. Thallium sulfate, a slow acting poison. Hadley could have slipped it into Jennings' drink while he was still at Plover's rest. And Jennings could have attacked Gerald Hadley, without realising he was already dying himself. But the clothes. Why take the clothes? Well, somebody didn't want us to know he was a gender bender. Chief Inspector Barnaby. Oh, yes, Chief Inspector. James Jocelyn here of Jocelyn Tibbles and Delaney. Yes, Mr Jocelyn. I mentioned to you that Mr Hadley had a property in London. Yes. Well, I thought you ought to know I've just received various documents from the bank. Do you have an address? Uh, well, yes, that's why I telephoned you. So, you got here then? Yes. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> so, what's all this about then? This is some sort of <laughs> joke, right? <laughs> I don't think it's very funny. Raping a 15 year old girl? Rape? There was no rape! You call calling Edie a liar? Who do you think the police are going to believe? What? We could come to an arrangement. How does five thou strike you, Bri? I haven't got five thousand pounds. You can raise it, Bri. A middle-class ponce like you. No problem. <laughs> Why? What have I ever done to you? I just tried to help. Push off, Brian. Yeah, just get out. Oh, Brian. You left these. Don't you think 
doing, Brian? Is it good? Oh, it was great. That was our coup de théâtre. <laughs> what? It was a scene. You told us to work on the scene. You said we had to surprise you. <laughs> I bet we surprised you. <laughs> a scene? Yeah, so that we could like, work it into the play. <laughs> You can do what you bloody well like! I must have been mad ever to have wasted five minutes, let alone five months on any of you! Or to have thought that the stinking sewers that pass for your minds could ever begin to understand the first thing about drama or literature! Why don't you all crawl back into the gutter where you belong and stay there and rot? Well, that wasn't very nice, was it? All right. Plan B. it. Looks like there's a storm coming. I think he lives here, sir. Shh. Why do I feel as if I know this place? What? I know this place. I've been here. You can't have, can you? It's the story of a young boy, an Irish boy. Liam has bought a flat. It's overlooking the Albert Hall. That's it. It's a wonderful book. It was all in the book. Which book? He lies on the bed, the cushion cool against the curves of his neck, and traces his past against the mouldings on the ceiling. The book Max Jennings wrote about Gerald Hadley. That's how I know this flat. It was in the book. It's not possible. Oh, yes, it is, Troy. Look. His name is Liam Hanlon. He meets a man, an artist. He's painted him lots of times, always in historical dress. They travel together, first in Europe and then Turkey. Why didn't I read the book? I should have read the book. Liam Hanlon, the boy, meets an artist. The artist paints him in historical dress and the painting sells for a fortune. It's all in there. And Liam Hanlon... Was Gerald Hadley. Yeah. He was sexually abused. He killed his father. And he runs away from home. He gets rich. And then one day, he tells Max Jennings everything. 
But why did he do that? I mean, how did they meet? Do you remember what Bouncing Barbara said? Well, Max used to be a psychiatrist before he was a writer. Now, we already know that Gerald Hadley was a transvestite or a transsexual, whatever the term is. Isn't it possible he visited a psychiatrist? And if that psychiatrist were Max Jennings... What? Jennings took what Hadley told him and put it in a book? The Faraway Hills. Gerald Hadley was never married. His life was a complete sham. The photograph, the dead wife, was just a prop. And he probably hid that himself because he knew Max Jennings might see it. But Hadley was afraid of Jennings. No, no. That's what Amy thought he was saying. But Hadley was afraid of being left alone with Jennings. He was frightened of what he, Hadley, might do to him. Well, think about it, Troy. What would you do if you told someone, professional healer, your friend, all your innermost secrets, your entire life history, and he turned it into a best-selling book, what would you do? I'd kill him. Exactly. And that is what Hadley did. And you want a drink? I'll get you a drink. We'll never know exactly how he did it. But after Max Jennings went back into the house, when the two were finally alone, that must have been when it happened. Laura Hutton was outside when Jennings came out. She told us he took his time getting into the car. She thought he was drunk. She was wrong. He'd been poisoned, and he was feeling the first effects. So, Gerald Hadley killed Max Jennings. But did Jennings kill Hadley? No, I don't think so. Laura Hutton saw Brian Clapper there, and he saw someone else. third figure approaching the house. But who was it? It was whoever killed Gerald Hadley. Sir? Oh, more drag. What a surprise. We found this in the same room, sir. It's the same paper Honoria Lydiard had. Another copy, yeah. He received two commendations. He would have been an admiral, I'm sure of it. There. First in Europe, and then Turkey. Antalya. What? It's a port in Turkey. God, I must have been blind. She folded this over when she gave it to me. It's a Lester. Not the ship, Troy. Use your eyes down here. Look, look, look. Well, who are they? That's Ralph Lydiard. Same face we saw in his wife's photograph. And the other? It's Gerald Hadley. Liam, the character in the novel, spent time in Turkey. But we now know that Liam was actually Gerald Hadley. Which means Gerald Hadley was in Turkey. Exactly. Which is where he met Ralph Lydiard. Antalya. Yeah. That's what sent Honoria scuttling round to Hadley's house. She was besotted with her brother. And here, suddenly, there was someone in the village who actually knew him. Getting a case on Moria to pack. Who's in these clothes? This dress is covered in blood.
Honoria killed Gerald Hadley. Of course she did. Amy almost gave her away when she contradicted her. When? When we first asked Honoria about her movements on the night of the murder, do you remember what she said? I retired straight away. I had a bad headache. Retired didn't mean go to bed, which is what I thought she meant. Amy actually told us the next time we met. Amy went to bed. Honoria retired to the study. And then she went out again a few minutes later. Back to Gerald Hadley's. Oh, yes. I couldn't believe he'd known my Ralph. My darling Ralph. I tried to see him earlier that afternoon, but he wasn't there. And I couldn't talk with all those people there. So you went back that night? Yes. I had to see him. I couldn't wait. Gerald? I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So disgusting, so beneath contempt. But I asked him about Ralph. I had to know. That's what I'd come for. Do you know what he... What he told me. Do you know what he said? Yes, I knew him. Your dearest darling, Ralph. We were lovers, Honoria. I had him, and he had me. Now get out of my house! No! She killed him, and she must have taken all the clothes. She didn't want anyone to know. She must be as mad as a hatter. Hatters, Troy, very sane people compared to Honoria Lydiard. You should have died too, not just him. She wanted me to die. She was waiting. 
It was AIDS, wasn't it? That's what killed Ralph. She knew. And she hoped that she was waiting. Go on, get her out of here. <laughs> Preston? Yes, I did. It's not serious, is it? I'm afraid it is, yes. It seems I have an allergy. An allergy? What to? Oh, no. Oh, yes. What? Cats. Kill Mousky. Yes. You mean all that scratching and sneezing? <laughs> it's not funny. No, 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 I'm sorry. Curry? You're not going to take this out on me, are you, Dad? Oh, yes, I'm going to make your life hell. 